Hi, I'm Paul Kogan from GK Tuition, and in this video I want to talk to you about inferential statistics. Now the question that I've chosen to go through here is 2018 paper 2 question 2. In the first part of this question we're given a normal curve, and the z-score is marked in as z1. And all we're told about it is that 67% of figures lie below this z-score in a normal curve. Or in other words, the proportion of figures below this z-score is 0.67. And they ask you to find the value of z. Now this is relatively straightforward. If you go to page 36 and page 37 in your log tables, all of your z-scores and the corresponding proportions are there. So they've given you the proportion is 0.67. So you're using page 36 and page 37 probably in the opposite way that you're used to using it. This is a proportion. So this is one of the figures in the middle of the table. So it's not one of the ones in bold. The proportions are the figures in the middle of the table. So if you look, it's actually on page 36. There's a value 0 0.6700. That's one of your proportions. And the corresponding z-score for a proportion of 0 0.67 is your z score is 0 0.44 okay so it, that that's a z score that represents uh, a piece of data that is 0 0.44 standard deviations above the mean so for that question that's all you had to write just you had to find the corresponding z score and that's it okay for part b of this question i think this is the type of question when you're dealing with z scores you should always draw graphs i think drawing a graph here makes life so much easier it really explains what's going on Mary sits two different tests. I mean, the, fir the first test she sits is a maths test. The average result in the class was 70, and the standard deviation was 15. So you can just view the standard deviation as a measure of the variability of the data. Whereas on the other hand, in the English test, the average result was 72, but the standard deviation was 10. We're told that Mary got 65% in her maths test, and she got 68% in her English test. So in both cases, she's a little bit below the mean. And we're asked to figure out, relative to all the other students in the class, in which test did Mary do worse? In other words, we need to turn this 65 into a z-score. We need to turn that 68 into a z-score. What we want to do is compare Mary's result to the average result, taking into account the variability of the data. And luckily for us, there's a formula for this in our log tables, the standardizing formula. The standardizing formula, in this case, the x value would represent Mary's result, mu would represent the average result, and sigma would represent the standard deviation. So you'll notice I've already worked my way through this. In the maths test, Mary's result was 65, the average result was 70, and the standard deviation was 15. So to get my z-score, I compare Mary's result to 70, so 65 minus 70, divided by the standard deviation. In other words, so that works out as minus 5 over 15. So Mary's z-score in her maths test was minus 1 third, which as a decimal is minus 0 0.3 recurring. So Mary's z-score in the maths test was minus 0 0.3 recurring. Whereas in the English test, her x value, her result was 68, the population mean mu was 72, and the standard deviation was 10. So the data is less variable, which means the difference between 68 and 72 might be more pronounced than the difference between 68 and 70 in the context of this one. So to get my z-score for English, it's 68 minus 72 over 10. And that works out as minus 4 over 10. So her z-score, if I write it as a decimal, is minus 0 0.4. So you can tell clearly from these, from these figures that her z-score is lower in the English test which means that relative to other students, she did worse in the English test than in the maths test. Okay, in B part two, we're told that the top 15% of students in the English class were, met, were given an A. And we need to figure out what percentage would a student have ne needed to have gotten in order to be in the top 15% in that class. Okay, the, to start this question off, it is the exact same as part A. It's, we're going to do the exact same thing as we did in part A, and we're doing the exact opposite to what we did in B part 1. It's literally line for line. We're going the other way around. This time, I know that, like, okay, so let's say this is John, and John was, John was better than 85% of students in his class. In other words, he's in the top 15%. So let's say John's result is better than 85% of students in the class. So I need to figure out 
what is John's Z score? If 85%, if 0 0.85 is less than John, then what is the corresponding Z score? So you go to your log tables on page 36 and page 37, and you're looking for the closest value to 0 0.85. Remember, you're using your log tables in reverse. The proportion is 0 0.85. And if you look in your log tables, the closest value to 0 0.85, the Z score for that is 1.04. If, so, if someone has a Z score of 1.04, then they're better than 85% of everything else in the normal curve. If you, so John must have had a Z score of 1.04. Okay, so now I know that John's Z score was 1.04. The average, the population mean is still 72 because it's the same question. The standard deviation is still 10, so the only thing that I don't know is X. And X represents John's result. So I need to figure out what result did he actually get. So I'm using the standardizing formula again. The only difference is this time I know Z, I know Mu, and I know Sigma, and I'm looking for the value of X. So you just sub in your values here, and it's relatively straightforward algebra. Your X value works out as 82.4%. So if a student in this class got 82.4% in the English test, then they would, that result would have been better than 85% of the other students. In other words, they'd be in the top, just inside the top 15%. However, you have to be careful on the wording in the question. It asks you what is the, the smallest whole number value that would have merited an A grade in this exam. So you cannot round down, because if you round down then you're going, you're, you're no longer better than 85% of students, you're only better than maybe 84 or 84.5%. So you have to round up. If a student got 83% in the in this English test, they would have been able to say that they were in the top 15% in the class, and that would have merited them an A grade. In the final part of this question, we're asked to estimate using the empirical rule or otherwise the percentage of students who got between 52 and 82 percent in the English test. Now I know that the average result in the English test was 72 and the standard deviation was 10. Which means that if a student got 82 in the English test, well 72 plus 10 gives me 82. So that represents someone who got the, this, the average plus one standard deviation. So 82 in that case represents the average result plus one standard deviation. Whereas if you notice you're 52, well, 72 minus 10 would have me at 62, minus 10 again would have me at 52. So that represents subtracting two standard deviations. That's two standard deviations below the average. I can use that information to work out the percentage of figures, estimate the percentage of figures between 82 and 52. I've drawn, I've drawn a sketch of our empirical rule here. According to the empirical rule, in any normal curve, 68% of figures lie within this region. 68% of figures lie within one standard deviation of the mean. In other words, if I take the average and add one standard deviation and then take one standard deviation away, then 68% of all of the data will lie in that range. So let's just split that in half. If I know 68% lie between there and there, if I split that in half, then clearly 34% lie there and 34% lie there. So that's what I can say for this bit. This represents the average plus one standard deviation. So I know 34% of the class must have been between 72 and 82. I can use the second thing from the empirical rule to work out what this region should be. According to the empirical rule, in any normal curve, 95% of the data will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. In other words, if I get the mean and I add two standard deviations, and then I get the mean and I subtract two standard deviations, 95% of all of the data will lie within that range. So in this case, I need to get half of 95. Half of 95 is 47.5. So I know now that if I just take this half of it, if I subtracted two standard deviations from the mean, well then 47.5% of the data would have to lie in that range. And that represents what's happening here. If I take two standard deviations away from 72, I'd be at 52. Which means that 47.5% of the data has to lie in there. So the percentage of students that got between 52 and 82 would be 47.5 plus 34. If I add those together, 
I'm going to end up with 81.5%. Now notice how that's an estimate. If you use the, the empirical rule as an estimate, because you know from your confidence intervals or from your hypothesis tests that actually 95% of the data lie within 1.96 plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations. So the empirical rule is just an estimate. That's what the or otherwise was in this question. If you wanted to be more specific, you could have turned 82 into a z-score, turned 52 into a z-score, and read the values off page 36 and page 37 in your log tables. However, if they give you the option, it's far easier and far quicker to just use your empirical rule as an estimate. Okay, so I hope that video made sense. If there's anything you're unsure of there, then just let me know in class or send me an email and I'll try and explain it to you differently.